The title of my sermon this morning is Grace and Peace. One of the things that I have very fond memories of just from, you know, my early adulthood is getting packages. I mean, Tabitha and I, whenever, we, you know, we go to the post office, Cameron's with us, you know, Cameron's jumping around, are we going to get a package? Are we going to get a package? She gets all excited. I'm sure all of us do. I mean, I'm, what, 32 years old? I'm still excited. I mean, you get excited when you get something in the mail. But sometimes... That stuff you get in the mail just isn't very, like, you'd be kind of surprised that they were even allowed to send it in the first place. So I'm going to give you a list of five things that were sent in the mail that you'd be kind of surprised that they were. The first couple I didn't think, the first one I didn't think was that interesting. A drone. A college student gets mailed a $350,000 drone. Uh, more or less, a, college, a student ordered a workout bench, a weightlifting bench, and when the package drive via UPS, he got an additional package, also addressed to him, thinking it was part of the unit he ordered. He opened the box only to find out that it was a drone. You know, he posted the photos on Reddit and they went viral. It turns out that the drone, as you can see, was actually from the National, how do I say it, the weather people, um, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. And I, we have, I'm kind of curious what happened. Did they come and get it? I would hope they I, I personally wouldn't hold it back. It was addressed to him, but... Number four, I guess, counting backwards, a slave, a slave to his freedom. Can you believe this? Back in 19, or 1849, not 19, 1849, a guy named Henry Brown claimed a heavenly vision to mail himself to essentially to freedom. On March 29th of 1849, Brown tucked himself into a wooden crate with the help of a couple of other people, including a storekeeper friend, and the 200-pound box was shipped to, Philadelphia, to the Philadelphia home of abolitionist James Miller McKim 27 hours later. So he spent 27 hours in this box. He touted his escape, which caused the Fugitive Slave Act to be passed in 1850. More or less, he ran his mouth so much that they weren't able to do this ever again. Frederick Douglass, a famous African-American, um, obviously anti-slavery guy, was a little upset with him, thinking, you know, if he just kept his mouth shut, this might have been a more common thing that they could have done. Either way, I mean, interesting way to use the mail. Number three, an entire building. In 1916, William H. Colt Harp was going to build a brick bank in Vernal, Utah. The bricks he wanted were 127 miles away in Salt Lake City. And he calculated the best way to send them all, all 80,000 of them, was through the U.S. mail at that time. I don't think it'd be possible now. And so he had, so he had crates packed under 50, the 50-pound 50 limit, 40 at a time, for a total of 40 tons worth of mail. And he mailed all this stuff. The Utah Post Office was overwhelmed, but, but did indeed deliver the entire building. However, as a result, they, they essentially changed some rules that made that impossible. All right, the, the last two are my, my absolute favorite. Number two, a live cat. In New York City, from 1897 up until 1953, all the mail was, was shipped through these tubes. They put a bunch of mail in a cylinder, pop it in this tube, and it would be sent around. When this opened, and it would go around at 35 miles per hour, too, which I thought is kind of important, for the inaugural event of this general post office, they, they sent a Bible, a large fake peach, and for whatever reason, a live cat. <laughs> a fake peach. A yeah, literally. A fake peach, a Bible, and a cat. <laughs> so according to one attendee who wrote about it in 1931, the cat seemed dazed but unharmed. Thank God. Finally, here we go. Children. The parcel post system in the United States began in 1913. And almost immediately, people began testing the bounds of what packages could be sent. In mid-January that year, Mr. and Mrs. Jesse Burns of Glen Estate, Ohio, realized it would be cheaper to send their son to visit his grandparents via partial post than buying a standard rail ticket. They paid 15 cents in stamps, and here's the and they insured him for fifty dollars. <laughs> the postmaster quickly outlawed this practice, but people kept some skirting the rules, including sending a 14-pound baby to grandma, which obviously sending to the grandparents seemed like a popular thing to do. Uh, and after after the a peak in 1915, they were finally able to put an end on mailing children. I don't know why, because honestly, it costs a lot to send your kids back to the East Coast. I mean, so mailing them would be a whole lot cheaper, I think. 
but I, I'm pretty sure they won't let me do that. So, so while some things seem kind of strange to, to get in the mail, I would say one thing that was probably quite embraced and, and, and celebrated was a letter from the Apostle Paul. You know, when the Apostle Paul writes you, you probably read it. I mean, if Paul or someone important sent me a letter, I'd read it too. And of course, the Apostle Paul being a leading figure amongst the early Christians, they were quite excited about this letter. So this morning, we're going to begin our study of the first epistle or first letter that the Apostle wrote, which is in our Bible. The first general letter, not general, that's not a good word. The first letter that he sent out to one of the churches. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you now for all the blessings that you poured upon us. I ask that you help me uh, declare your word in an appropriate way, that, in a way that makes sense, and in a way that could be applicable to each and every one of us. Help us know that you love us very much, and that you want us to turn to you and rely on you. Help us know that it is only through you that we could have peace, and that the only way we get that peace is through grace. So Lord, now, as we turn to you, touch me and touch our group here, and everyone in, within hearing of my voice, Lord, allow all of us to partake in your word today, in your name, amen. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 1. In researching Paul's writings, it took me a little bit of time and a little bit of a, you know, I was actually going to start preaching from 1 Thessalonians. Then I realized that 1 Thessalonians was probably not the first letter he wrote. It was Galatians, as I'm going to explain to you in a few moments. So we're going to take a look, starting in the book of Galatians. My goal, and it's a very tentative goal, is to see if I can preach through all of Paul's writings over the next however many years. I don't know if it's going to happen. I'm just because I'm telling you now. I mean, all of and minus Romans, I wouldn't pre, I won't preach the Romans because we studied through it about a year or two ago, more than a year or two ago. A little while ago, we went through the book of Romans. So we're going to start in Galatians, which I believe was the first book that Paul wrote, first letter that he wrote. So as we're going to see, Paul's introduction section of this letter or to the people of Galatia contains three parts, which are going to be my three points. So number one, the sender who wrote slash sent this letter. So let's look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, and then the first part of verse 2. So Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not sent from man, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me. So the author clearly tells us his name is Paul, which is good, because, you know, I mean, that would be kind of difficult to explain who else would have written this book. The Apostle Paul wrote the book, and very little debate is, re is involved with this, other than maybe some people who are really not walking with God in the first place. The bottom line is that the Apostle Paul wrote this book. Paul describes himself as an apostle. Apostle is a transliteration of a similar Greek word. That Greek word is apostolos which means a delegate messenger or one sent forth with others. Now, if you remember, you might remember me telling you this before, transliteration of something is literally when you take a word in one language and write it out, spell it out, in another language. Baptism is another example of this. It's a transliteration of a Greek word. So apostle is literally us spelling apostolos in English. So to understand what it means, we need to look at the definition of the word, like I said. My understanding of a biblical apostle was one who had witnessed the resurrected Christ. This would limit the total number of apostles to only a select group of people. And I'm going to give you a list of some individuals that we know were considered apostles. This group would have most definitely included, of course, the 11 remaining disciples after Judas killed himself. And then Matthias, who was Judas's replacement, if we look in the beginning of the book of Acts. Another individual that more than likely was an apostle, but some people say he wasn't a full apostle. There was some... A debate on the extent of his apostleship was, was Barnabas. I believe Barnabas wrote the book of Hebrews. I don't believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. I think Barnabas did. Barnabas was involved in the first missionary journey that Paul went on. And we're going to hear a little bit about him today. It's probably throughout the rest of our study of the book of Galatians because he was present around this time. James, who is the half-brother of Jesus was also an apostle. He was considered an apostle because, again, if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says that Jesus appeared to James. And then finally, Paul, who was appointed as an apostle directly by Christ, as we will read in a few moments. Paul indicates in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that there were also other apostles. So the exact number of apostles, we don't know. 
But I do think, and I'm going to explain in a moment by a couple verses, that an apostle was typically an individual who witnessed the resurrected Christ. If you have not stood in front of the resurrected Jesus, you're not an apostle. Just the way this works. So Paul tells us in first uh, Romans chapter 5, oh, let me back up. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, verse 5, as well as later on in Galatians, and in Galatians chapter 1, verse 16, and um, chapter 2, verse 8, that he was an apostle to the Gentiles. And, and we're going to read what Jesus told Paul upon converting him in a moment. That's essentially going to explain that as well. Paul was also an apostle, like I said, because of seeing the resurrected Christ. Let's take a look at it, actually. Um, Acts chapter 26. Why don't you turn there with me? Keep your finger in Galatians. Go with me to Acts chapter 26. And we're going to read verse 15 down to verse 18. Acts chapter 26, starting at verse 15. So in this particular instance, Paul is in kind of on trial. He's been given an opportunity to speak in front of a large group of people with the main individual there being King Herod Agrippa II. Luke records him as saying this, Acts chapter 26, starting at verse 15. And this is Paul essentially giving his, uh, his uh, conversion experience. He's telling the story of how he came to know the Lord. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? And this is Paul speaking. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. And here's the key part. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Jesus appeared to Paul to appoint him as a servant and as a witness of what he has seen and will see. I mean, again, just kind of pointing again to Paul's apostleship, being as a result of Jesus appointing him directly. None of the other apostles could say that. I mean, other than, again, I guess the 11 disciples were present in Jesus's, it was, were in Jesus' presence. But they were not appointed directly by Christ. Christ did not say, you are this. They just kind of became that as a result of their relationship with Christ. The apostle Paul was directly appointed by God. I mean, in understanding Paul's background, his past, he was a very sinful individual. He was living in sin. And he was murdering Christian people. So for this radical transformation to take place, it had to be done by God. God himself, Jesus himself, led him to a relationship with Christ, of course. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And you are not, and you, are you, are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. The key, or one of the main things I want to point out, and is this. I, do, I know other denominations believe in apostles. I do not believe that, a, that an individual today could truly be an apostle the way the Bible describes them. It just does not, it doesn't line up. They could be something else. They could be called by God. But to call someone an apostle, I believe, is wrong from a biblical perspective. So Paul goes on to reiterate his ordination as an apostle in the rest of Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. In my Bible, it was in parentheses. And he more or less goes to do it. He does this by telling us that he was not sent by man, nor by the agency of man. Meaning he wasn't sent by an individual that wants him to be an apostle. Nor by a church that wants him to be an apostle. But by God and Jesus themselves. Very important here. And this is the reason why Paul is saying all of this. The early church had some issues when it came to the relationship between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. The Jewish Christians followed the law to some level. The Gentile Christians didn't have to. Thank God, we don't have to make sacrifices. We don't have to do that stuff anymore. The early church struggled with that. There were a lot of Jewish Christians who had it out against Paul because of this. They felt that Paul preached a much lesser gospel to the Gentiles than he would to the Jews. You know, when he would preach to the Jewish people, not really would he, but the message to the Jewish people involved something that revolved around the law. Something that revolved around following the law. 
for us today, or for the Gentiles, the law was not essential anymore. Jesus came to fulfill the law. We don't have to follow the law. And that's what Paul was preaching. Unfortunately, some Jewish Christians didn't like that. And they passed around bad word about him, including to the people in Galatia. Which is why Paul, and as we're going to find out in the coming weeks, focused quite a bit on verifying his apostleship. We're going to hear another uh, example. He's going to essentially reiterate his conversion again in the book of Galatians. In the coming weeks, we will study that. And more or less, though, the point here is that Paul is saying that his apostleship did not come from himself, others, or, an, or a church, which is an agency, a Christian agency. The only agency they had back there was the church in Antioch, but directly from God. And as we're going to find out in the book of Galatians, like I said, Paul's going to spend some time defending this. So before I move on, I want to also talk about the date. And this is important because I wanted to preach through the books in chronological order. So if Galatians isn't number one, we have a problem. Some people believe that the book of Galatians was actually written to the northern area of Galatia. We're going to see a map in my next point kind of looking more at this. And if we believe that, for the most part, we're going to have to say that the book of Galatians was written at a later date. It was about ten years later, and I don't believe that could be possibly the case. I mean, Paul had just, for the most part, I believe that it was written, the book of Galatians was written just after his first missionary journey, around the year 49 A.D., his first missionary journey along with Barnabas was from the end of the year 47 AD to the beginning of the year 49 AD. So just after these allegations come up, Paul feels the need to write a letter, and that's what he does. He writes a letter back to these people. So finally now, let's take a look at the end, or beginning of verse 2. Beginning of verse 2 tells us that Paul's message was not one held exclusively by him. This wasn't one that was exclusively his message to the Galatians. It was his along with another group of people. It says, And all the brethren who are with me, all of this would, they, this would have most definitely included Barnabas, who was part of that church, as well as, I'm sure, other influential Christians of the time, but also the, the prophets and teachers whom Paul ministered to. We read about that in Acts chapter 13, as well as his fellow workers and, Christ, and church members. I mean, these were people that were there, people that were, that were part of this church in Syria and Antioch. And as you see there, the bottom section is Israel. The upper section of the map there is Syria. And Antioch was a primarily Gentile community up in this northern area. Salamis is part of the island of Cyprus. And then if you go up, you see Tarsus, which is where Paul was born, where he was raised. And if we kept on looking in, in a moment, you're going to see a map that's going to show the rest of what we understand as Asia Minor or modern-day Turkey. So. so now let's take a look and let's move on to the next element of this introduction, which is the recipients of this letter. So two. Who is it to? Who was receiving this letter? And look again at the end of verse 2 of Galatians chapter 1. It says, in all, no, that's in all the brethren who were with me was the end of his, uh, his from, his, his, the senders. And then it says, to the churches in Galatia, or churches of Galatia. Like I said, Paul wrote this letter to the churches. He's helped start during his first missionary journey to the Galatia region of Asia Minor, modern day south central Turkey. As you kind of see there, this is a, just an expanded map of what we had before. You, that is his missionary trip. That was his first trip. He departed from Antioch, sailed into Perga, and went up first to Pisidian Antioch. So now we have this issue of we have two Antiochs. So Syrian Antioch and Pisidian Antioch, down to Iconium, to Lystra, and the Derby, and then he backtracked and headed back and made his way. Mark, remember, Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark, actually left their group. He had issues. Mark departed, went back to Jerusalem midway through this journey. Paul went back to Antioch, then eventually he goes down to Jerusalem for the, um, the first church council that was held. Now this letter was not, I, I think it's important to answer that this letter was not a universal letter to the church, as in all of Christians, because I don't think that was understood at the time. There was no universal church at the time. There was only this little area of Christianity. Christianity hasn't expanded to the point it is today, nor that it would be in the coming years of Paul's ministry. So Paul was writing directly to the church in Galatia, yet this information is still very pertinent to us as well. A little bit about Galatia. You know, at the time of Paul's visit and when he wrote them, Galatia was a Roman province. Agriculture was a big industry in the area because of the fact that the region sat on a large and fertile plateau. 
It was for this reason that many had moved to the area, and thus the reason that Paul ministered there. Paul's ministry strategy was to focus in the major cities that had large numbers of people and to go out from there. Paul would begin in a major city, like he said, those four major cities. He didn't tell everyone about Jesus. He told as many as he could, and those individuals in those new churches went out from there. It wouldn't make sense for Paul to go and just kind of go circulating the whole region, trying to tell everyone he can, doing it all on his own. Instead, Paul built up these churches, started these churches, and then as we find out, he wrote letters to the churches later on encouraging them. And as a result, these churches grew, and they performed the ministry that Paul had envisioned in the long run. So the letter was written by Paul and sent with the other individuals in the church in Syria and Antioch. It was sent to the church in Galatia, the Christian churches in Galatia. And now my third element of, the, of this introductory section of the book of Galatians is prayer. He wrote a prayer. Paul essentially wrote a brief written prayer to the church in Galatia. Let's go ahead and look at the last three verses of my text this morning. Galatians chapter 1 verse 3 down to verse 5. So Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from the present or this present age, evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. So I thought that the New Living Translation translated this verse very powerfully. So let me read you the New Living Translation version of the same three verses. Uh, Paul says once again, May God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. So Paul starts his prayer off by asking that God would grant the church grace and peace. And then he ends this prayer by exclaiming or explaining how the grace and peace come to be. And that, of course, is through the blood of Jesus. We get grace and peace through Jesus' death on the cross to forgive us of our sins and his resurrection from the dead so we can go to heaven when we die. Kind of a brief side thought here. I thought this was kind of interesting. The Grace was the typical greeting of a Greek individual. While peace, of course, shalom, was the typical greeting of a Hebrew individual. So it's just kind of an interesting thought how Paul used this terminology. So now let's take a look very briefly as, like I said, I'm heading towards my conclusion uh, at grace and at peace. The Greek word used for grace comes from the word caress and means that that which affords joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, lovely, loveliness, grace of speech. So it kind of has that overall meaning of, you know, gracefulness. But of course, the true meaning of this word in the context we're looking at is greater than that. It's the grace that God gave us when Jesus died for us on the cross. The loving grace that God gave us in saving us. Strong Concordance gives this definition from that perspective. It says, Goodwill, loving kindness, favor of the merciful kindness by which God, exerting His holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps, strengthens, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affliction, and kindles them to exercise the Christian values. The spiritual condition of one governed by the power of divine grace. And isn't that the truth? I mean, I think about how difficult life is, and if I had to do things on my own, I'd be in trouble. It's only when we allow God to govern us, to guide us, through His grace that He gave us on the cross, that we could have peace, which is kind of is jumping ahead a little bit. So the grace that Paul is asking God to pour upon the Galatian Christians is the grace that Jesus gave all of us upon dying on the cross. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 down to verse 10, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His, meaning God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. It goes grace, faith, works, not work, faith, grace. God saved us. Before we did anything to achieve that salvation, all we had to do was believe it and have faith in it. And as a result of that grace through faith, we serve Him and we work for Him. 
If it was the other way around, oh, we'd be earning our salvation, and that's not possible. We can't possibly earn our salvation. Romans chapter 6, verse 12 down to verse 14, Paul writes again, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And what, what kind of something that came to mind, Tabitha and I have had some issues with Cameron the last couple of days. I mean, she's been a little bit of a handful. You know, she doesn't always listen. You, know, you tell her to do something, and the next thing you know, she's doing it. You know, no, don't do that. She's doing it anyway. She doesn't listen. If, I mean, it's easy for you to get frustrated with her. But because she's your child, because you love that child, you have grace upon her. And isn't that the same with God? Because let me tell you this. I mean, Cameron looks like a saint compared to the sins that I've committed in my life. I mean, each and every one of us can say the same thing. We don't deserve God's grace. He gives it to us freely. We don't deserve the love that Jesus gave us in dying on the cross. He did it anyway, though. We don't deserve it. Yet He loves us and wants us to be with Him. He gives us that grace for free. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to do anything to achieve it. All we have to do is believe and accept it. So now the Greek word used here for peace comes from the noun irene, which means in this context the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ and so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever, of, of whatsoever sort that is. And it's also the, the idea of peace being of the Messiah's peace, a peace that we can only have through a relationship with God. One can only have peace if they first embrace the grace of God. That's the tie-in together. You know, we always say grace through faith. Really, it's peace through grace. You are never going to be, you're never going to feel peacefulness on this earth. You're never going to have peace within your heart if you don't have a relationship with God. I mean, really, if you think of it. I mean, imagine if, you know, I like, I like using the zoo illustrations. I'm not going to jump into a pit this time. But imagine if one of those lions got out and were chasing me. I'm never going to have peace in my life as long as that lion is chasing me behind me. That lion represents sin. Jesus represents the keeper that's going to catch that lion and keep that lion from me. On my own, my sin is going to catch up to me and bite me in the butt. But with Jesus, I'm going to be forgiven of that sin and I'm going to have peace. I'm not going to have to worry about the sin chasing me down. Of course, sin, that could be the devil too. I don't have to worry about that because that's how much God loves me. We only have peace in our lives and on this earth and with God if we have faith in the grace that Jesus gave us in dying on the cross and rising from the grave. Only through Christ can one have the peace that comes with the assurance of God's grace. Jesus tells us, John chapter 14, verse 27, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled. Nor let it be fearful. And then Jesus says once again, John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Jesus has conquered. It's over. It's done. We have no need to fear because Jesus is there. What is that uh, underdog? Have no fear. Underdog is here. Have no fear. Jesus is here. We're all set. Paul tells us, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Talk to God if you're frustrated with life. Talk to God if you're stressed out. You can have peace if you rely on Him. Then 1 Peter, Peter can't be left out. We've been doing a lot of Paul, and now when you talk about Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the proper time. Casting all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Isn't that the truth? God cares for us. Edward R. Ristillo, and I don't know if I'm saying his name right, he writes in the Galatians chapter, the Liberty Commentary of the New Testament, In Christ, God revealed His grace, and through Christ, He bestowed His peace. 
Grace is the sum of all the blessings extended by God. Peace is the sum of all the blessings experienced by man. It is through the grace that God gave us that we could have peace. So embrace the grace of God in order to feel his peace. Let me close up now. Now, I am sure that each and every one of us has received an amazing package, something that makes us excited, something that we just can have joy over. Oh, I got something in the mail. Like I said, my kids were excited. Every time Mama and Papa send them something in the mail, they get excited. But I'm telling you this, not one of those packages, not one of those letters equal the greatest love letter ever written. Of course, that is right here in the Word of God. When I was in New Mexico, I just when I was in New Mexico, I had the opportunity to take a handful of uh, teenagers back to Connecticut, where they got to experience Connecticut. And, and the interesting element of that weekend was that was when I met my wife, kind of. You know, Tabitha and I rekindled a relationship that we had back in high school. Not really, I didn't really know her in high school, but we got to know each other again. And then we started writing after I went back to New Mexico. We wrote letters to each other when she went to boot camp. And as my, I loved getting those letters, I was quite excited. I mean, I was probably in love with her already. And of course, beyond that, it kept on going. We fell in love, got married. It was great. Those love letters were amazing. But even those letters aren't as good as the Word of God. Because it is here in the Word of God that Jesus shows us His love for us. That God shows us His love for us. It is only through this that we can truly have peace. And of course, it's only through the grace of God that we can have peace. Have you read God's love letter to you? He wrote to you. Have you read it? Have you opened it yet? I mean, I can't imagine my relationship with Tabitha being where it is today if I never opened those love letters. I had to open them. I had to read them. I had to write back. God wants us to open his love letter, to read what it says, and to act out upon it, to write back to him. So today, that's my challenge to you. Put your trust in God. Enter, you know, embrace the grace that God gave you, and you will have peace. If you embrace his love, everything will be okay. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loves us to such an extreme that it's not even possible for us to truly fathom. And then, of course, the one we all know, John three sixteen and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. So today, if you're, having a, if you're living a life where for some reason your life isn't balanced and you don't feel the peace that God gives you, it's time to tell Him. Because that's how awesome our God is. He just wants you to talk to Him. Tell Him that you're having struggles. Tell Him that you're having a hard time. And embrace the grace that he gave you again. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you now as we turn to you and as we close here. I thank you for the grace and peace that you gave us. I thank you for all the blessings that you poured upon us, Lord. Lord, I can't imagine living a life absent of you. So Lord, I praise you now as I'm able to say that I am yours. But Lord, if there's anyone here that does not know you, if there's anyone here that does not have a relationship with you, or if there's anyone here whose relationship with you is struggling, allow them to know that all they got to do is turn to you and embrace you and tell you how much that they love you. And you will love them back. You already love them back. Before they even had a thought of you in their minds, you love them. So Lord, I praise you and I thank you now for your amazing grace. In your name, amen.